Welcome to Black Art Today's video series, Uncovered. Uncovered is Black Art Today's intimate conversations with artists of African descent that represent African culture in the genres of literature, visual arts, and the performing arts. In today's episode, Black Art Today interviews historical romance author, Camille Robinson. Welcome to Historic Glendon. Uh, this is a historic neighborhood inside of Reisterstown that often people don't see. They call it like one of the best kept secrets. And we are in an 1892 Gothic historic Victorian home uh, that was the home of Samuel Yeats, who was the meat and ice house person in Glendon. Um, they were pretty well to do and they all had homes downtown in Baltimore. And they would take the train, which still runs today, which is now not an Amtrak, but you know, a regular cargo train. But they take the train up to the, which is now the post office, and that used to be the depot. And then they would walk up here and these were their summer homes. So you can imagine in those days, 1892, having a home in the city and a summer home out in the country. So that's what these houses were. Where we're in right now is um, considered the formal parlor. And everything in here, uh, as far as the crown molding, floors, fireplaces are all original, intact and untouched, which was what was very interesting about the home. This was uh, Samuel Yeats' room, uh, and there were several family members who lived in here in other parts of the house. He, however, would have his little bed in here, did all of his functioning in here, and would walk in and out of the window versus the door. As you can see, the windows are floor to ceiling, so he would simply lift them up and use them as an entrance in and out of the home, which we thought was a very interesting tip of the history. This is actually the original fireplace. And the fireplace, which has an interesting story, uh, is where the, they did their cooking. And it's one of the fireplaces that we were told by a, an expert guy who used to do chimney work that the fire would roll out and then back up in. So, which is very interesting, but the fireplace now is a gas insert. It's not functioning anymore because we now vent through our kitchen. But it's quite an interesting hearth, and we were able to restore it so that it looks very well. And we've added our own piece that's also something from the 1800s. Not this house, but we felt that it fit perfectly. And period piece furniture that we find, again, throughout our little travels. And this is kind of the place that the home and hearth where everybody comes in. And if you look right here towards the floor, you will see that this used to be a back staircase. Um, the servants would go up and down the stairs to the rear because of course they were not to be seen uh, in the front. But the homeowners, I believe the third homeowners decided that it took up too much real estate here and then they removed it. And if you can see right there, they, they capped it off. Hubby and I collect black memorabilia and if you can see around you, you'll see all of the black memorabilia from the foods that we're having. Black people were, you know, uh, predicted as looking uh, very cartoonish, you know, the watermelons, stereotypes of us. But I found it bit fascinating um, that this is a piece of history that lots of people choose to act like doesn't exist. But I say, as with everything, you have to embrace what it is about our culture, because what happens is, is if we're not embracing it, then it thus disappears. And a lot of these things are, believe it or not, in antique stores, shoved in uh, most likely a lot of Caucasian people's attics or things that their family members had. And quite frankly, lots of people that I've talked to who I've purchased these things from, they're often very ashamed that their parents or their great-great-parents had this stuff as well, so they're getting rid of it. And as black people, I think that we need to embrace every part of our culture, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly. This is an acre and a half, so it goes all the way back. I'm, I come from a family of gardeners, my grandfather, my great Great grandma, my great grandmother, my great great grandmother, I believe they were all gardeners. Um, they gardened, of course, for sustenance, food, what have you. I gardened for pleasure. <laughs> I'm not growing any food, I didn't need to invite any more deer. So um, I'm quite the gardener. We give a little thing right here, we're still working on getting the patio in. But um, I've been, if you go around, we come back out front, you'll be able to go around the front of the house and see the work that we've been doing. Trying to restore and um, bring the gardens back to life. So I would like to read you a small excerpt from the beginning of the book, um, Unloved, uh, for the love of Benedict. Uh, and this is where Benedict is first being introduced into the world and you're walking into a situation where he is not very comfortable, but it is something that he has to do on a consistent basis. 
1766, New Orleans, Louisiana. He was purchasing human flesh again. No matter how many times he'd done so, it never got any better. People milled about, ensconcing him like a wool blanket in the middle of the summer. The air so thick it tasted like deep breath he was taking underwater. A trickle of sweat slid down the side of his face, disappearing beneath his limp cravat as the blistering Louisiana sun beat down upon his head. Dust from the dirt rolls swirled about, settling across his fine linen suit. The smell of unwashed bodies permeated the air, and his stomach roiled as he fought to retain his gag reflux. Swallowing the bile that threatened to rise in his mouth, he licked his parched lips, grimacing at the gritty taste of the dirt. It was all he could do to keep from purging. He was certain he would unman himself if this foolishness didn't come to an end, and quickly. Benedict Xavier LaRue held a scented handkerchief to his nose, and the pungent odor of excrement blended with the lavender scent of the fabric. It was of little help. Agitated, he thinned his mouth, and he muttered a curse, wondering how much longer it would be until the next group was brought onto the block. A small but quiet crowd gathered inside the auction house. Benedict's eyes trilled to the long rows of slave pens. Speculators swarmed along the crowded pens, poking and prodding the slaves as if they were objects, not human beings. The sedate mood was a juxtaposition to the chaos about to ensue. Several slaves were chained together. Hideous iron collars were locked around their necks. They milled about in dazed confusion. Others were smiling, dancing around as if they were happy to be sold away. Their skin had been slathered with so much lard that their faces shone like freshly polished leather. Benedict knew that many masters forced their slaves to behave this way in order to be sold. They thought it would make the slaves appear jovial, as if being enslaved was a thing one truly desired. Yet children were ripped away from their mothers, husbands sold away from their families, siblings bartered away like common pigs. They had no retribution. They had no choice in the matter. They absolutely suffered, some quietly, some screaming, and some slowly slipping away into insanity, and others so broken they often took their own lives. I was just very interested personally myself in what love would have looked like in the 1700s, right in the thick of slavery. What would that have looked like? How hard would it have been to love? How were the families? How did they get through all of the trials and tribulations, whether they were enslaved or not? So that was very interesting to me. I wanted to know what did love look like? How did it feel? What was the struggle? What was the passion? I know in present times how we fight for black love in today's world, in the world of modernity with everything available, everything we can touch and all the access and a lot of the bonds that we didn't even have um, back then. But people then, what did they do? How did they feel? How hard did they have to love in order to overcome all of the obstacles that were literally thrown in their face. So that to me was very profound uh, reason to write a book that didn't exist, that talks about those very things that are very important to us. Camille Robinson is an African-American historic romance author who is really determined to tell a story about black people that people just don't know about. We are quite the dynamic race, and I found that there was a piece of history that was often glossed over, underrepresented, and it was interesting to me to tell a tale about a time that is very difficult to talk about, and also to change people's mindsets, or basically to change the narrative of what people think that they know about Black people, even Black people. Believe it or not, Unlove was 
kind of fast. Um, it took me three months, but the majority of the book was written on a flight to Barcelona and back, which is about nine hours. And I was scribbling away with my little hand because I like to hand write my stories versus typing them. Uh, and the passenger next to me looked at me and she kept staring at me and she, and she said, you're actually using pen and paper, which I guess is a little bit obsolete, but a writer's spirit is in her hand and um, her, her energy flows onto paper and there's something very cathartic and spiritual about that. So a love was born in the air, 41,000 miles over the Atlantic Ocean, coming back <laughs> from Barcelona. Writer's block is very interesting and lots of people talk about writer's block and I, I, I'm around a lot of authors and say, oh my gosh, I can't think, I can't think. I am the type of person who doesn't believe in writer's block. I believe in spiritual block. And I think what happens is, is that when your spirit is empty, it's hard for you to be very innovative or if you're in a state in your life where it's hard for you to see yourself out of, how can you possibly be creative in that process? So for me, I don't believe in writer's block at all. My problem is, is that there are too many characters and too much dialogue going on. So then what winds up happening is, is that they're all fighting to get on page. And I just have to all tell them to back down because I don't have time to be trying to get them all on page. I got two hands, people. Two hands. Hence the reason why this woman has written eight books in four years. And it is insane. And they fight me to get their stories told. So a lot of people who know me will say... Do you feel that you connect with like real people who from the past who are wanting their stories to be told? And I say, hmm, you never know. Character creation is um, quite interesting. One, for me, um, it, it, it was a very cathartic uh, ordeal for me to be able to create my characters. All authors are very different, but I have to know what these people look like. So the first thing that I do is I will find out, you know, when was this person born? Because I really believe that your sign, your horoscope, tells a lot about who the individual is, if anybody ever looks at horoscopes. And so I looked up um, dates of birth, and I gave them a date. Then I looked for names, and that was hugely important to me, because the name of a character says a heck of a lot about them. Um, all of the names of the characters that I have in my book are actual real slave names. Um, and those names were picked up from the Whitney Plantation down in New Orleans. I mean, excuse me, not New Orleans, actually in Louisiana, right outside towards Vacheray. But they have these wonderful slave stones with all of the names documented of the children who died before the age of four on the plantations. And it's thousands and thousands of names. And these people, um, these young people have no voice. Uh, they lived very minimal life, if any at all. And I felt it was my way of giving homage to them. So every name of the characters in my book are from these children who have lost their lives so early on. So Benedict was the first name, and I thought it was quite interesting because it was Benedict with an E, unlike Benedict with just a plain T. And I was like, absolutely. And then once I picked him, I went ahead on and I looked up his horoscope to find out that he was stubborn that he was very orderly, that he's a leader, and that he's very family-oriented, and he wants his way. I can see, because of today's time and the climate of the world now, what's going on around us, that a person would have questions as to why I have this character as such, you know, he, he's like almost a bore. He, he is a misogynist. He is very particular. He might be even very racist on certain parts, but why? I had to be careful about infusing modernity into pastimes. When you're telling a story, um, unless it is a futuristic and you're creating a world, uh, that's different. But when you're creating a story that has to deal with something that's already happened, you as an author have an obligation to be true to the past. And the past was, was this is how it was. Creoles were in one sect. Africans were in another, slaves were in another, Caucasians or whites were in another. So it was very important to me to be authentic to the characterization, especially Benedict, who's extremely strong. However, I will say that Benedict is a complex individual. He's extremely complex. Um, he's not what you think he is. So as I always say to people, be careful about judging the book by its cover. I actually have people who've been reading the book um, try to guess which character is me, especially in the first book. And it's very funny because the character that I feel that I portray the most um, is not in the first book. She's mentioned, and her name is Barbary, Barbary Vassar. And she's the mother of Benedict, the hero in the book. And um, 
Barbary has a small mention in book one. In book two, Barbary has a little bit more of a voice. And in book three, she jumps off the page and owns it like nobody's business. And when they read book three, people are going to say, oh, yeah, that's that's Camille. Oh, absolutely not. Nope. Nope. I didn't want to be an author. Actually, I wanted to be an artist. Um, I like to draw and I vision myself doing these beautiful murals and paintings over buildings and people would want to put my work in their homes. And then my mother was like, yeah, right. <laughs> go, go on to college and get a job that's going to pay some money. And so I went to college and I actually majored in um, political science and English as a minor. Uh, and I really didn't think about being a novelist. It didn't cross my mind. I was an avid reader and I loved to read. In my 20s, I toyed around with and wrote like a contemporary romance novel for myself, actually, because they didn't have that many of black people and I wanted to know what it was like. So I wrote it and um, on legal paper and it's still sitting upstairs in my attic right now. And I, whenever when I have a chuckle, I'll pull it out and take a look at it. And then one day I just decided, you know what? Maybe I'll shoot my hand at it. I don't think that publishing is difficult. I think it's tedious. Um, my story was interesting, actually. Uh, one of my friends, who was also an author, had invited me to a writer's retreat, which was fantastic. And I went there, and the owner who put the retreat together was very interested in my work and um, invited me to do a contest to win a publishing deal. And much to my surprise, I actually won the contest, which consisted of a $150,000 prize along with a publishing contract which I promptly turned down. Um, it was important to me to stay very true to my narrative. It was important for me to put my hands on the process. So I decided to self-publish and I found the whole process extremely gratifying. And the knowledge behind it that you achieve from the learning the process um, is priceless, it's priceless. Well, first I would say that 16 year old Camille, I would let her know to never let anyone sway her from doing what brings her joy. And we tend to do that a lot in life. We tend to sacrifice the things that you love the most based upon what other people believe to be important, um, whether that's money, um, whether that's a corporate title, whether that's a big sprawling house. I don't care if you want to live in a hovel on the street corner playing a bucket of drums. If that's what makes you happy and you can get yourself a McNugget at the end of the day to sustain you and your spirit is fully invested, then that is what you should do. Awesome. Black Art Today, wow. You know, I was really um, elated to hear that there was going to be a premise for authors and musicians and artists and whatever type of art form you have to have a platform to be able to get your stuff out there to the world. Um, as Black people, it's important to have things like Black Art Today to allow us to be able to show the world who we are and what we do and what we're made of. It is a world now where we have to go to every other race but our own to look for resources. And I think that we are diamonds in the rough. We have so many resources. And I think sometimes we just don't allow ourselves to think bigger than what we are. So Black Art Today is huge. Um, any company of Black people are huge when they are promoting each other. And self-promotion is tremendous. It's amazing. Um, if it not were for Black Art Today, I might not be heard by other people at all because they may not understand our story or want to tell our story in the mannerism in which we want to. So I appreciate and pay homage to people uh, like the owners of Black Art and other entities of, of Black creativity who are making a way for people like me to be seen and heard.